WNYC Studios is supported by GEICO. Do you own or rent your home? Sure you do. Fortunately, GEICO makes it easy to bundle your home and car insurance. It's a good thing, too, because having a home is hard work. Go to GEICO.com, get a quote, and see how much you could save. GEICO.com. Easy. Mudslinging, mayhem, and a Roman emperor with a broken heart. Where do I go? What do I do? Who will help me? It's Handel's Agrippina on the latest episode of Aria Code. Listen to Aria Code wherever you find your podcasts. Listener supported. WNYC Studios. It's the Brian Lehrer Show on WNYC. Good morning again, everyone. In-person classes are beginning today for New York City elementary school kids. The restart had already been delayed twice because of staffing issues and worries over safety. And over the weekend, the union representing the city's principals, a group that rarely gets into such political fights, said it lost confidence in Mayor de Blasio's reopening plan, so much so that the principals' union is now urging the state to take over the city schools for the remainder of the pandemic. Speaking of the pandemic, my next guest represents one of the areas that is now seeing a spike in our area, and he is chair of the city council's education committee. So we'll talk about both of these things now with Mark Traeger, city council member representing parts of Southern Brooklyn. And again, he is chair of the council's education committee. Council member, welcome to WNYC today. Thanks for coming on. Great to be with you, Brian. Thanks for having me. So what do you make first of the principal's union vote of no confidence and request of the state to take over the city schools? So I have been hearing from uh, school leaders, educators, uh, parents uh, throughout this entire period. And uh, it, it is no surprise to me that a number of school leaders have have lost confidence because, Brian, there's a difference between headlines and the fine print. Uh, regardless of what the mayor wants to project on, you know, each morning at his press conferences, uh, to this date, we are still experiencing severe teacher shortages in our schools. Uh, we still have thousands of kids without devices and, and internet service. So I believe that principals are just responding to the facts on, on the ground. The one thing I, I'll note uh, is that um, in their call for the state education department to take over the city schools, it is not clear to me how much power NYSED has now, uh, because when the state legislature voted on on their budget... And, and just to be clear, NYSED is the New York State Education Department as opposed to the city. Go ahead. C- Correct. Yes, Brian. Uh, the state education department uh, would normally have a lot of power uh, over over school districts. But when the state when the state voted uh, on their budget earlier this year, they voted to give the governor extraordinary power, including over NYSED. So it's not even clear to me how much power NYSED has left during these temporary emergency measures. Uh, but having said that, I stand in solidarity with educators and school leaders that the mayor's proposal uh, is still very inadequate, and it also fails the equity test, Brian, for kids and families who need more in-person services than what they're getting right now. I think you're saying Governor Cuomo could wave his magic wand and take over the New York City public schools. Is that what you're saying, and do you want him to do that? Uh, I have appealed to to the governor's uh, office because the mayor's plan is inadequate. Uh, but I, I want to say this, Brian, it's not enough to just simply ask the governor to, to, to you know, wave a magic wand. The governor has to also allow the city to have emergency borrowing authority so we could operationalize plans. That's what I've been calling for from the beginning. The city is financially broke. That's the, that's the worst kept secret at City Hall. Uh, I'm also a member of the city council's budget negotiation team. So I see I see the same numbers, which the mayor's office sees as well. Uh, We need borrowing authority immediately. We need to begin to operationalize plans in a responsible, responsible, meaningful way. So, yes, the governor has the power to intervene. But more than just simply waving a finger at the mayor, I think the state of New York needs to help the city get through this very difficult financial time. I want to get back to something you said a minute ago about there still not being enough teachers to really open the schools. And yet 
here we are on day one of reopening, at least through elementary school, and the upper grades are supposed to start on Thursday. On on um, Friday of last week, the mayor, as he does every Friday, was on this show taking questions from me and from listeners, and he wouldn't release an exact number of teachers that they were still short as of Friday or how many holes they still needed to fill in order to get to reopening today. And here's the end of that exchange. You're saying there's a zero chance that staffing would you know, be a Brian, cause for the further problem, delay. I, I, don't, I don't do hypotheticals because we're dealing with the health care dynamics and everything else. I'm not going to do that. And I'm honestly, I don't think that's productive. I'm just saying I'm telling people, zero chance I'm just that telling you what I, uh, the truth is. The truth is that we are getting the people we need in place, period. So the mayor didn't want to say there was a zero chance that he would have to delay the opening of school again because of staffing shortages, but he did say we are getting the people in place uh, who we need, period. Do we have the people in place today that they need for the elementary school grades because the schools are open? Brian, the answer is no. Uh, Many schools still do not have the staff which they need. And I want to be even more blunt, uh, particularly in the high school uh, field. uh, Many students will not be receiving in-person instruction. What they'll be receiving uh, come Thursday is what I call supervised remote instruction, which means that if the high school has a couple of chemistry teachers and they're both out on medical accommodations, they don't have, you know, a, uh, this infinite pool of substitutes of, of chemistry teachers in the city of New York. So you're most likely going to have a teacher from a different licensed area uh, supervising students uh, who have laptops or have iPads in the class uh, while their teacher works from home. Uh, that is because in high school, uh, Brian, you have a licensing dynamic that you don't really have in elementary school. In high school, you need to have a licensed teacher to teach that specific content course. I was a licensed history. I am still a licensed history teacher. Mm -hmm. You can't put me into a chemistry class to teach chemistry. In in elementary school, you need a general license where they can move teachers around and move subs around. The The high school dynamic is far more complex and complicated because of state regulations And that is why I am telling you that many high school kids will not be getting in-person instruction come this Thursday. They will be getting supervised remote instruction if they have technology. Brian, this morning I spoke to a high school principal of a small high school in New York City. She is still short 150 devices plus Internet for her students. So they're not even ready for remote instruction either. So to be clear, when you say um, supervised remote instruction, I'm trying to figure out exactly what that means, and maybe some <laughs> some parents listening to uh, are, sure. are as well. Do you mean in that chemistry hypothetical that you just gave yeah. that there might be some high school students who've chosen to go back in person Correct. who will then be getting their chemistry class from a chemistry teacher who is themselves at home? Correct. Correct. Uh, so they're... In in many cases, uh, you're going to see students uh, not getting in-person instruction from their teacher. Their teacher will be working from home, uh, you know, using a, a laptop or a technology device to connect with them remotely, while a, a teacher from a different department or a substitute teacher will be physically in the class just supervising them, I watching see. them, but not teaching, right. correct? Okay, but we're in a pandemic, and a lot of teachers are older or have other underlying conditions that led them to get these uh, exemptions, what would you have them do? Maybe that's the best solution and just the best they can do. Uh, I don't think this is the best solution, Brian. Uh, I have laid uh, forward a different vision, a different proposal going back to July. I waited for the state health department, education department to release their reopening guidance before I shared my proposal. I believe that, as you mentioned, we're still in a pandemic. We're too large of a school system to come back all at once at the same time. 500,000 students of the 1.1 million go to elementary school, which today we're seeing the return of elementary school. What I believe is that, uh, which I think passes the equity test for kids who need more in-person services uh, and for working parents who are facing impossible childcare situations right now, is that we should give, um, first of all, we need the state to give us money to operationalize all the safety plans. The IBO confirmed my concern that 
the guidance placed more cost on the city, about $33 million a week, an estimate that the IBO released in terms of safety guidance. Uh, but I believe that we should uh, allow elementary school children and all children with IEPs, multilingual learners, kids in temporary housing, the option of five days a week in-person services with the option to opt out while keeping high school remote. Um, I believe that this is uh, an approach that actually uh, will provide more help and services for kids who really need it. The, the, the child care and the development needs of a, of a four or five year old are far greater and more intense than, than of a 17 year old. Now again, high school kids certainly need more help and support and services. And I think that we could work on that through libraries, cultural institutions to provide enrichment settings for them. But I think as far as in-person school, even with this hybrid test, uh, this hybrid blended learning model, Brian, one one day a week for many kids, it's mm -hmm. not working. So I think I think it, it just it fails the equity test also for working parents. And again, you're, you're only four years old once in your life. You don't get this time back. If kids are not reading at second grade at, at level, it's very hard to catch up later. So I, I think that this blended learning actually puts the additional staffing sh uh, strain on schools because you need really three groups of teachers. You need a, a teacher for cohort A on Monday and another teacher for cohort B on Tuesday, and you need a group of remote teachers. And that's what's exacerbating the, the staffing shortage experience by schools right now, Brian. We're going to take a short break, and then when we come back, we're going to talk to Councilman Traeger about the related issue of the COVID spike in parts of his district in South Brooklyn. Of course, that's an issue in and of, it itse in and of itself, and we'll get into that, but it's also an issue with respect to what to do about the public schools in those neighborhoods that have a greater than 3% test positivity rate, which is supposed to be the standard. And listeners, we can take a few phone calls as well. First of all, I wonder if any parents or teachers or principals are out there and want to give us an early report on day one for elementary school today. Do you have any uh, early notion? I realize it's just the, the morning of the first day, but do you have any early notion of how it's going? Parents for your kids or maybe some teachers on prep periods are listening right now. And Mark Traeger just got a voicemail. And 646-435-7280 is our phone number. Any first day reports, parents, teachers, principals, any, anyone um, that we can learn from and pass along to the city council education chair, who's our guest, that he could then use to help make, make sure things go better tomorrow. 646-435-7280, 646-435-7280. So we'll continue on that and the COVID spike right after this. The New York Times' expose on President Trump's taxes has eyes popping. We'll get into what it means for the presidential race and how D.C. is responding. Plus, as baseball playoffs come closer, a group of black players are working to help make the sport more diverse by getting resources into the hands of youth around the country. All that and more. I'm Tanzina Vega, and that's next time on The Takeaway, weekday afternoons at 3 on 93.9 FM. WNYC supporters include St. Francis Heart Center. Their approach to heart and health care is rooted in high science, and their culture is built upon human understanding. More at chscardiology.org. The Brooklyn Museum, presenting Studio 54 Night Magic, an exhibition tracing the history, social politics, and trailblazing aesthetics of the iconic nightclub, on view at the Brooklyn Museum now through November 8th. <laughs> Brian Lehrer on WNYC with City Council Member Mark Traeger from parts of South Brooklyn doing double duty here, uh, one in his role as chair of the Education Committee with today being the first day of in-person schools for elementary schools in New York City and also his district uh, being one of those that has a COVID spike going on right now, parts of... Um, parts of South Brooklyn there. And let me let me tie those two together for you because the mayor has said schools will automatically close if 3% 3% of COVID tests citywide come back positive. Um, 
there is a higher than 3% positivity rate now at the neighborhood level in parts of your district, Gravesend and Bensonhurst, which were singled out by Governor Cuomo yesterday as COVID hotspots with a warning to get it together. Here's a little bit of the governor on the 10 hotspot zip codes. The infection rate in the top 10 zip codes is about 15%. Uh, Those top 10 zip codes represent 2.9% of the state's population and 25% of the cases. 2.9% of the population, 25% of the cases, positive cases. So, Councilman, A, what's going on in your district? B, should the public schools in your district close? So uh, I, I represent uh, parts of, of the areas that, that are mentioned. Brian represent Bensonhurst, Gravesend, parts of Coney Island and, and Seagate. Uh, I, I want to just first underscore something that even relates to, to the overall school system that applies to the response to COVID-19 and, and the pandemic. Trust remains shattered, Brian. Um, it remains shattered in the school system and it, it remains shattered uh, in, our, in our communities. Um, and that goes for local, state, and federal level. Obviously, the federal level, it's, it's, that, that goes without saying. But remember, this is a city that was very slow to, to shut things down at the start of the pandemic and is trying to ramp things up now. And a lot of folks hold responsibility at the local, state, and federal government. I want to tell you, Brian, that I was in touch recently with a yeshiva leader in Gravesend in my district. They are they are closed for 14 days. They are co- cooperating with the health department, but I want to share with you, Brian, and and your listeners, that they only really heard from the city uh, leadership only until after the confirmed cases. And when I asked them about whether or not the city asked for their reopening plans and they asked for other types of information or offering support, um, there was radio silence. And so what worries me, Brian, is that we're, we're reactionary. We're not proactive, and that's the same situation, I think, in the broader school system as well. You need to solidify trust, especially in a crisis. You need to make sure that you're communicating with folks, not just after the fact, but before things in crisis starts. Um, Now I could tell you that they have ramped up communication. They have ramped up messaging. I have seen, I've been on email chains. I've been on on calls. Uh, But I I believe that the response was, was really too late. And, and now they're ramping up communication efforts. But Brian, in, in, when you're in a crisis, you need to communicate with folks, not just after things happen, but throughout this entire time. And I think that what's happening here is that you already have communities that are not very trustful of government for a variety of reasons. And that, that, will, that will lead to bad decisions and that will lead to bad outcomes. Uh, so now I, what I could tell you is that I've been in touch with the city administration. I've been in touch with local community leaders and some yeshiva leaders and school leaders. Um, they are hearing more from city agencies. They're hearing more from authorities. They're going to be ramping up uh, what's called the rapid testing. They're going to try to get more information out there in culturally responsive ways. But it's, it's sad that, it, again, it happened after the fact and not before. Uh, they had access to these numbers before they were rising to a level of 17% positivity rate in one day. Uh, but you know we have to double down on efforts to communicate, build trust, and, and make sure people are, are complying with, with very important safety guidance. Well, how can you, let me linger on that for a second uh, with respect to how the city can do that and whether you think this is what's going on in those parts of Brooklyn is an artifact of coronavirus being an item in the culture wars. Um, the very orthodox communities in question, and we know which communities these spikes are taking place in, and they are orthodox communities. I guess we just have to say that yeah. directly. They're, you know, in Rockland, it's Muncie and Curious Joel. It's Borough Park in Brooklyn, uh, parts of Gravesend and Bensonhurst that are, that are relevant. It's Borough Park. And they're generally seen as politically conservative and Republican, not to generalize too much, but assuming that's accurate, in general, do you think they're believing coronavirus disinformation, including from the president, that masks don't matter very much and that things can reopen safely indoors more than they really can? There's no question that the federal government, uh, President Trump, 
is leading to uh, enormous amounts of distrust and chaos uh, in, in communities in New York City and, and Orthodox and other communities in New York, not just the Orthodox, but uh, uh, other folks who are questioning the science, questioning leaders like Dr. Fauci, who is a Brooklynite who I admire very much uh, more so than ever. Uh, there's no question that plays a role, but but that that tells you, Brian, that as a local and local leadership, you need to double down to build trust and to build those relationships. We already know the, the behavior of, of this of this president, uh, and I think that that's why it puts more pressure on state and local leaders to solidify and build that trust. And that trust that trust is broken, uh, you know. And look, there's no to me. There's no excuse. Folks need to wear masks when they're outside. Folks need to socially distance. Folks need to wash their hands frequently. They need to stay home if they're not feeling well, call a doctor. And we're going to keep repeating that and keep reinforcing that. But I, I do believe that communication goes a long way. Building confidence goes a long way. Staying in touch with credible messengers in the community. I mean, the fact that, you know, I spoke to Yeshiva leader and they didn't hear anything from City Hall until after the, the crisis, they didn't even hear about you know whether or not they wanted to offer support for, for the reopening plan. All communication was happening with the state of New York, not the city of New York. So I made sure I alerted the city that you cannot wait until after cases are confirmed to communicate with schools. They have a responsibility to make sure that all, sc all school communities are safe and, and, and supported, Brian, uh, public or non-public. So uh, this is an issue that that it's we need an all hands on deck approach, but I can't underscore the importance of building trust and continuing and building these relationships, regardless of people's political views. We're in a public health crisis. Southern Brooklyn has been hard hit. We're seeing these upticks again, and we have to double down on, on building trust and in compliance with very important safe, safety rules. I saw an article on one of the news sites this weekend about three people uh from Orthodox communities in Brooklyn having died recently of coronavirus. Do you th I don't know what the, the real numbers are or how fur much further that goes or how many hospitalizations there have been. Uh, do you think that's going to be a wake-up call for the community? So I spoke with uh, recently Maimonides Hospital, and uh, they obviously have a different uh, version of, of events and what's happening uh, they are seeing, uh, you know, kind of an uptick in some of the cases uh, as far as admissions. And these are no question warning signs. I mean, this we, we are still in a pandemic that has never stopped. Um, but I think, Brian, I think to underscore this point, it shouldn't take uh, a day of seeing numbers rising to 17 percent for the government to formulate a, a response. We need a sustained response. Uh, you know, flattening the curve is one thing. Remaining flat is, is, is what's important until there's a vaccine and until we can, you know, finally defeat this pandemic once and for all. I believe that folks got very overconfident over the summer. Uh, there was a lot of, you know, folks were talking about how they flat beat the curve, crushed the curve. Uh, we're, we're in a pandemic. This virus uh, does not go by any calendar, does not go by the political calendar, doesn't care if you're Democrat, Republican, liberal, conservative. Uh, it, it, it's still out there. And so you need leadership at the local level, state level, to continue with a consistent effort to get the word out, to ensure compliance, and to continuously build trust. I can't underscore, Brian, the need to continuously build trust. Let me get a few phone calls in here before we run out of time. And starting with... Nancy in Manhattan, who I think has a report on um, public school opening day one. Is that right? Nancy, you have a kid in the uh, lower grades. Hi. Oh, I think you're talking to me, but no, I don't. My, I have a child in high school, and what I wanted to talk about was the frustration that I feel every time I hear about kids not having enough devices. Uh -huh. Because the, school, the students like my son, who he has his own laptop, he could bring that into school and use it but the schools don't allow the students to know the Wi-Fi password. And so therefore, when he goes into one of those schools, he's going to a school where uh, it's all remote, whether you're in person or at home. Um, so he's going to go into school just because he's going to be a first year in high school, so some social aspects because he doesn't know any kids that are going to the school. But they won't allow him to bring in his own laptop and he has to use a school device because they won't give out the Wi-Fi password. And it's so frustrating to me. 
to hear that when I know there are so many kids who don't have devices yet. Nancy, thank you very much. Eamon in Brooklyn, you're on WNYC. Hello, Eamon. Hi, it's Eman. Um, I wanted to ask uh, um, Mr. Traeger a question. I'm one of his constituents. I live in Seagate. Um, and tonight I'd like to ask him, is he attending the uh, executive con committee meeting tonight? Uh, for, forgive me, uh, which, there's a number of meetings tonight. Which, which meetings are they referring to? Uh, the one where they're voting on the proposal that would take away the county committee, uh, the registered Democrats who signed up to be county committee members. Um, there's going to be a, a vote tonight on whether we should have a Zoom meeting to include all of these registered Democrats as county committee members or whether to take those thousands of Democrats who are registered and give their votes to district leaders instead. I'd like to know how you were going to be voting on this proposal tonight. So this is with regards to a, a Brooklyn Democratic meeting tonight uh, with, I believe, district leaders and a number of folks, uh, Brian. Um, and I, look, I, I need to get a lot more information th th than I have about the number of these proposals that are being discussed there tonight. So I need a lot more information before I make a decision on that. All right. So I'm not aware of the issue, but yeah. you're saying you haven't taken a position on the issue that she's asking about. That's Sheila, correct because, right, yes. One more. Sheila in Brooklyn, you're on WNYC with Councilmember Traeger. Hi, Sheila. Hi. I just wanted to say to Councilman, you know, I understand what you're saying about trying to build community trust and trust with communities. And I think people, you know, certainly that has to be done over and over. But I think there comes a time when, you know, individuals in the community also need to start taking some personal civic responsibility and understand that, that you know, this is, this is really important. This weekend I, was, I had to drive through Midwood and, you know, Orthodox community. And, you know, Brian, I, I, I actually feel like I did one of your um, thoroughly un scientific uh, surveys because, <laughs> you know, I started realizing all the people that were out walking around without masks. And it actually, I started counting them, you know, on my destination to and from. And, I, you know, I came up, the, came, the number I came up with, one and in four people wearing masks. The rest of the people, and there are a lot of people outside uh, walking around on Sunday, and they were one in four. And, you know, that's absolutely ridiculous at this point. So, you know, they can't say they don't know because they've been reached out to, and people, this is all over the media and everything. You know, it, it gotta put their, people have to put their personal beliefs in, aside at this moment and try to do the correct civic thing. For public health. Sheila, thank you very much. And we have 30 seconds left. Council member, respond to Sheila and maybe talk to your constituents. Short note, uh, Sheila, Sheila is, uh, you know, I appreciate she mentioned the word media. I want to just say, Brian, I wish all of my constituents uh, would listen uh, to the Brian Ware show. Um, and some folks in my district have different sources of media. You know, I, I am uh, from the Russian speaking community and, you know, I am a, I am a proud Democrat, but there are a number of folks in my community, for example, the Russian community that listen to certain news channels uh, that dispute the science. And so this is a battle for the truth. And it's I know it's it's I know it sounds simple, you know, listen to the media, follow the instructions. But we're up against a misinformation campaign. We're up against folks who have different media sources. I wish we all listened to Brian Ware. I, I, Brian's a gem in New York and in, in our, in our tri-state region. Uh, but folks listen to different things and, and they're hearing different things that the virus is over. This is a hoax. Um, and that's why we need credible messengers on the ground at the local level to continue to speak up. And speak and speak the truth and, and and protect public health. And I'm going to do all that I can from my end, but I need help from the mayor, from the governor, and others to do their part as well. Mark Traeger, city council member representing parts of Southern Brooklyn and the chair of the council's education committee. Thank you so much. Thank you, Brian. Thank you.